because I haven't released anything in so long, I wasn't sure if I was, if there was going to be any press mode. Like I wasn't sure even what was going to happen on that front. And then when I started working with Caroline, I was surprised like that there were more opportunities for that than I expected. So I, I like doing press stuff. I always like or mostly I liked it with Vox Trot too. And I know a lot of bands hate it. I really like it. I think it's, I think it's awesome to talk to people. So uh, like more. <laughs> was it just that you had been away for so long and you assumed that maybe like people didn't really care? Yeah. Or maybe, yeah. Also, maybe I just got like, it took so many years to make the album. And in this last part, it's like, I kept hoping at some point throughout the process in general, that somebody was going to swoop in and make it easier for me. Like I kept, you know, would periodically like send things to labels or whatever. I had all these, yeah, just visions of like, okay, so if I just keep working hard, like eventually uh, somebody will swoop in and I will not have to finish paying for this myself. And I, uh, that, which means I can do it faster. But in the end, like I had to do pretty much all of it myself, but actually I'm glad that that happened because I learned a lot from it and I'm super proud of the result. And it feels like, yeah, it just feels like a total growth experience. Just something I wouldn't have have chosen that way, but the way that it happened ends up feeling good. The last record was uh, was crowdfunded, right? It was partially crowdfunded. Is that a dramatically different process? That is yes. Um, that was an awesome process because I guess similar to yeah, when I did that, when I did the Kickstarter thing for the last album. Similarly, I didn't really know like if people were listening or what the response would be like. So I was very positively overwhelmed that it worked out the way that it did. But then I also thought after I did that, I thought, okay, I can never do that again. Like I, like I can only ask for money like that once. And then I think that can never happen again. You didn't even consider going back to that well? No, I, I mean, yeah, it just felt like, it just felt not right to me. Like it felt not right to do it twice. What was this process like? I mean, you know, especially when it comes to actually funding it yourself, what does that that look like? That means uh, booking studio time. That means paying the band. Yeah. So in this case, you know, on a lot of the tracks, or I'm trying to think, I guess in the finished thing, maybe about half or a little more, the people that I've been playing with here in Austin for you know, if more than a few years, basically it was like I, it was, you know, a solo project, but like I had bandmates uh, and that, and for a while we were kind of doing everything together, but then the last few years, the last like three years, it's been pretty much just me because they kind of reached this stalemate, you know, you work on it for so long and it's the momentum comes and you're like, yes, something's really happening. And then the momentum slows down again and that keeps happening. And then after a while, it kind of gets like, I think everybody's looking around going, well, what's going on here? And I honestly, at the time, like, didn't really know, but I knew that I really wanted to keep going. <laughs> I felt like that was the right thing, you know? So I kind of, without really saying it specifically, just took it upon myself to finish it to sort of what I had originally imagined. For me, it, it's mostly been restaurant work. I also still make some residual money from, you know, Vox Trot royalties and some from some uh, songwriting stuff that I've done with other artists. But for the most part, it's restaurant work. Vox Trot breaking up around 2010. Mm -hmm. um, I know you moved around a little bit and finally made it back out to Austin. Has it been largely restaurant stuff in the meantime? Yeah, it's been mostly that. I'm trying to think if, you know, when I was out in LA, I did... Some I did some yeah I did some songwriting stuff I taught some music lessons, but most of it has been restaurants and I've been very lucky that I've worked in places where they've let me come and go and they've been very supportive of my music career. Is that part of why that has made the most sense for you that you you in terms of working in an industry that like gives you that sort of flexibility where um, when when things are coming more than they are going that you can kind of get out and record or potentially go on tour? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, like versus I guess what you would consider yeah, like a normal 9 to 5 job, it's definitely easier for that. Also, I do think there's this weird thing of of uh if you have another career that is like a more full-on all-day career i think it is hard to still have the juice for the creativity the difference in terms of you know being in your like early 20s when, when you're yeah, in the totally. bands and 
you know, being able to, to work a, a nine to five or even more than that and then go and just like, you know, practice all night. I mean, there's a certain point in your life where you just it's a lot harder to summon that energy. Yes, that's true. But I guess it's funny that I'm fortunate that Foxtrot uh, took off when I was really young. So, well, I'm fortunate, but also the flip side of that is that I didn't establish uh, patterns of responsibility because Voxtra was signed by the time I was 22. So, uh, you know, I did not have to have, I didn't have nine to five jobs. I mean, I taught at preschool actually right before we really took off. But other than that, I didn't have nine to five jobs. Like I went straight from having just really occasional hospitality stuff, but nothing that committed to just being in a full-time band, which is incredible and felt like a, fairy tale at the time but the thing is that when it's over then when i was 27 then i had to re-enter the workforce and it was a very rude awakening for me but you know i think about that a lot in terms of like rock bands or, or you know baseball players of being like 27 you know in the grand scheme of things is not really old so it's wild to just be like well that particular dream might just be over now huh. yeah 27 is is definitely not old like now when i now, when I hang out with, or, or, you know, I work in a restaurant. So, of course, sometimes I work with 22-year-olds, for example. When I work with a 22-year-old that seems so young, I'm like, I can't believe that was me. But I was, you know, I had this other existence where I was kind of like, you know, traveling all over the world and doing all this stuff. It just seems so crazy to me when I see how young a 22 year old is. What is that moment like when you do sort of hit the wall with the band when it's clear that there's just nowhere else to go? Is your immediate thought like, what is the next thing I can do in music? How do I keep the momentum going forward? That's a great question. I guess it's weird because I, I actually sometimes think about the moment of acceptance that Voxtrot was over. I remember I was in New York City staying with our former manager and I kind of just brought it up in conversation like as though it weren't even a debatable fact. I remember saying, well, like, so this is obviously over. So we got to figure it out. It's weird to have that conversation with your manager and, and maybe not your bandmates necessarily right away. I know, but that's part of it is that by the end of the, you know, the, the relationships between bandmates often become so fractured that by the end, you're really not on the same page. And in our case, actually, somebody had already dropped out. So uh, it, it can go it can go really south in terms of the relationships. It's repaired now. But uh, yeah, I remember thinking, I remember just first having the moment of acceptance that it was definitely over without really having a plan. But then the immediate next thing was to think, okay, like, how can I do the next thing and how can I, and then you get sort of caught in this ego trap about like exactly what it's going to be like. And you expect that people are going to roll out the red carpet for you because they liked your former band and <laughs> tell you as a solo artist, it does not usually work like that. The math is hard, right? It's like how much of this was me and how much of this was just this, like ma the particular magic of this combination of guys. Right. It's a really, it's a really inexplicable thing. And I think it's, I think it is down to this idea that it is sort of like a spirit, like this idea of the muse or the spirit. I really do think that that is a real thing that you're like, when you're in the moment, when it's really working, you can't really explain why it's working, but like, you know, it's working and everybody in the room where you're playing knows it's working. It's, it is just like a magic thing. It's a, you're like, you're saying it's a magic sort of chemistry thing, but then, when it goes, yeah, it's weird because you would think that the same group of people putting, basically putting the same ingredients in would continue to create the magic. But there is a thing where the muse or the spirit goes and then it doesn't matter. You have those same five people working together and they still have the same skill set, but it's not there. That magic uh, force is not carrying it anymore. So it's, it's kind of like a dead weight. It sounds like there, there's two distinct factors that you're talking about here. There's there's sort of the interpersonal relationship, which is the one that I hear all the time. And it's it's a very common thing. It's, you know, it's similar to like having a, a, a roommate or, you know, I recently spoke to somebody, a friend of mine, and she said, um, never work with your friend. You know, <laughs> it's one thing if you're, it's, it's one thing to become friends with your coworkers. It's another thing to, to work with your friend. Oh, and that's funny. You know, I, I, situations in my life where I've like, 
you know, moved in with a girlfriend and it's like, uh, that is a really good way to test your relationship. Yeah. There's the interpersonal strain and then there's the, I guess, lack of inspiration. Obviously, these two things are probably linked from the standpoint of the band, but it sounds like you were kind of getting it from both ends. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And, and you know, now it's, I see it differently or sorry, now I understand that part of it is that uh you need anybody who's going to have a career in music, maybe a career in anything, anything you're going to be kind of long-term committed to. I guess you can make it analogous to like human relationships, but anything you're going to be long-term committed to, you have to accept that there are these periods where there is no magic, where the, the hard work job factor of it comes into play. And you just have to be really mature through those parts, appreciate what is there and kind of stay strong and trust that eventually the magic part comes back around again. Cause it's just how it is in life that it is not always an easy feeling, but it's, but it's kind of always working for your, like life is always working with you for your growth, you know? So if you can learn to open up to the times when it's difficult and not just rely on the times when it's easy, then I think that's how you have a long-term career in music. One thing it's a lot to ask that level of maturity out of a 22 year old. Yeah. In, in, in I any know, context. Exactly. I mean, obviously there's a lot of in, internal pressure in, in the band to, uh, you know, continue performing that, at that level, but there's so much external pressure, right? There's so much external pressure for, from the label. There's so much external pressure from like, as you said, you were signed really quickly, but also, you know, I was in New York at the time and I, you know, there was a tremendous heat around the band. So everybody is expecting you to perform at that level. Yes, that's true. And something else that, that you learn is that it starts off that, that whatever you're doing, you could say it's you, but I guess we'll go back to this magic thing. Whatever you're doing is actually the thing at the center, right? That has, that has attracted the label to you, that has attracted the listeners, that has attracted, let's say, internet press support, right? Whatever it is, that's what it is. It's the music is always, is like the central thing propelling it. And when you're the person making it, you have, okay, so you're, you're doing it unselfconsciously. You're not really thinking about it. Then it exists. And then all these people come to you in different forms. And then the hard part is very quickly you start relying on their reactions to know like if what you're doing next is the right thing you know you start looking out for these signposts of approval but the problem is that it doesn't work that way like people invest in you because whether literally financially like a label or just emotionally like a listener people invest in you because they are drawn to your vision. So it always is coming from inside and i think it's like really easy to lose the internal trust and when that happens, then sort of the product lose the, the product becomes less good because it's no longer a pure expression of you. It becomes something that's catering to the outside and trying to echo what it thinks will be most desirable, but then feels flimsy. Would you say that Vox Trot started off with zero expectations and zero pressure? I would say pretty close, pretty close to that. I mean, when the when we very, very first started out. You know, I I just really didn't, I was not trying to start a band because I was moving away for school anyway. So I wasn't trying to start a band. I just wanted to record some songs. You were leaving the country. That's right. I was leaving the country and I didn't think any, I really didn't think like, I don't know what I thought. I thought I would go to Glasgow and I was studying English literature. I think I just, I think I just, I was really into this, like what I perceived to be this ultra humble you know, Bell and Sebastian vibe, because those were my, that was my ultimate pinnacle of everything at that point. I still love them so much, but to the extent that you were going to move to Scotland, (laughs) to the, you would be surprised at the number of Americans hanging around Glasgow who have been drawn there by them. It is a crazy truth. (laughs) There is expectations when it gets to the point that you're like, Hey, I'm not going to college for a while or I'm not leaving the country. It's like all of a sudden when you make that decision, right. Doesn't that automatically take things to the next level in terms of expectations and pressure? Um, yeah, but that, even at that point, I didn't feel it. It actually wasn't until, it just wasn't until we got, once we got signed and then, 
we now that I'm talking about it in retrospect, it's pretty hard for me to pinpoint what is the turning point because it was so fun for a long time. I think like one big thing is that we saw it once we were signed, we actually had been playing the most popular songs of ours for like five years at that point. So for us, it felt ridiculous, the concept of putting out an album with those songs people loved on it. In retrospect, I see that commercially it makes way more sense. I get it, you know, like I understand from a commercial perspective, uh, but, you know, I don't know, like at the time, yeah, it didn't seem right. It felt like we'd already sold so many copies of like even CD pieces of those like over 10,000 each on our own. And they were clearly very available in the digital realm that it would be weird to have all this hype around the band and then just put out an album of the same 10 songs. It just didn't make sense mathematically to me. But in retrospect, I see it makes tons of sense mathematically. But that said, you know, even though the, the debut album that we did put out was not a commercial success compared to what was expected. I do feel, I I listened to it again recently after not for many years, I do feel like I'm proud of how musically accomplished it is. And I really feel, I really hear like the arrangement power and the, yeah, that kind of magic working together of the band. I think if, I think at the time I just viewed it as a failure and I don't see it like that anymore. Most musicians I, I speak to, you know, if they do listen to their old stuff, it's, you know, mm-hmm. because they're going on tour and have to have to replay it. And I understand not listening to something for from a long time from that standpoint. Also, it can probably be a little bit weird to listen to your old stuff and then some raw nerve there as well. But what what made you eventually go back and and revisit it? I don't know. I guess enough time just went by. <laughs> I guess it just got to the point that. I, you know, well, you know, part of actually me continuing forward with my career is learning to not have resentment towards the past, is learning to accept that everything is is part of this one continuous evolution and that like being bitter about what was and what no longer is or like having fantasies about how it could have been different is really not a helpful thing. So... I think like re-embracing, like being open to that music just as to what it is instead of what it means about me, I think is a healthier approach. I think regrets are are inevitable just for anybody in any in any line of work that's that's unavoidable. But obviously, it's not something that you can necessarily dwell on. Right. That bitter feeling or that sort of disappointment around that record specifically, that was a reflection of just a, a lack of perceived lack of commercial success oh i don't know i mean it's also the it's also like not long after was essentially the dissolution of the band so it's just kind of reminds me of a time of when you could feel that things were falling apart so it's that but oh well i mean if you can how do you get back to a point with no expectations is is it possible to return to that it is in that uh yes definitely i had to you know with the first solo album I had a lot of expectations and took a really, well, this one actually took longer, but for different reasons. Yeah. The first solo album, it took a long time to make. And I had a lot of expectations and it was sort of like getting my heart broken at each step of the way of thinking that it would be a certain way, that the reception would be a certain way that I would uh, be, it would be easy for, to get a, another record deal, et cetera. And then not really being the case. So uh, I had a lot of expectations that, were not met, but in the long term, it was good. First of all, it was good to actually be able to finish it and to put it out, and and actually with some some really good reception. Like I, I felt connected to listeners again, you know. And then after that, I really, I guess maybe my expectations were so lowered that after that, I really just ended up doing kind of a lot of soul searching that had nothing to do with music, and it slowly it's like a lot of forms of therapy and stuff. And it slowly brought me back to music because I, I began to remember that the relationship with the music is this kind of muse thing that we're talking about, or we were talking about earlier that it's, that it is sort of a mysterious spiritual relationship. And that is, it is a gift. It is a gift that you, that you get and, and you kind of need to work for it. Like you need to work in such a way that you're 
building your life around it. You're making with like literally like, you know, training my voice. Uh, so like getting my body, keeping my body in shape to do it, you know, constantly researching music, constantly listening to other arrangements, like whatever it is that I'm always working on it to make myself a better vessel for it. And then there is this weird thing that you kind of rediscover the love of it and you get re-enchanted with it. And it enables you to go back into making music in this way where it is really like uh, mostly a process of joy. And you, even when it's hard work, you really feel like you're kind of slowly building this thing that you absolutely adore instead of doing something And being like, oh, my God, I hope this is finally the thing that makes me famous again and makes me feel good about myself. Generally, when we speak about the muse or inspiration, it's almost this like passive idea of being a a vessel for inspiration. But Mm -hmm. you're also approaching it from the standpoint of something that you really do have to work for. How do you square those two seemingly (laughs) disparate ideas? Uh, Well, I guess it's. That's a great question. I I always think of it like, like there is, okay. So there's like a weird inherent thing that it's almost like, you know, and you don't know why you know this. I don't think it's just societal conditioning. It's like, you know, that if you're not trying at something, if you're just being really lazy in life and not taking responsibility for your life, you know, if you're not doing that, you kind of just inherently feel that it's not good. Right. Like you inherently feel like not good about yourself. There's some weird truth to that. There's a mental calculus that you know, like how much blood, sweat, tears you put into (laughs) something. Yeah, totally. So I think it's, it's like with the muse aspect, they're going, okay, it is this inexplicable thing. And we're kind of always waiting for the inspiration, but that you, you almost know that life like kind of needs you, expects you to work hard for your own good expects you to to work hard to kind of not waste your life essentially and it and that's like i think when the gifts of life come is when you're really giving your all it's almost like the universe or life is like you could say is like a conscious entity that recognizes it or something i mean you can tell when somebody forces it right you can tell yeah, a piece call, of yeah. art or mm-hmm. music when somebody's forcing it or as as the uh, as a kid say a try hard Huh, that's funny. Does that just mean like working hard towards something and, and sort of accepting when it doesn't come and moving on and then getting back to it? Yes. You're saying like, you mean like working hard and if it's not, if it's not feeling magical, then you like take a break and come back. This new record in particular, mm-hmm. it sounds like to some degree you were almost like working in shifts that there were yeah. cycles, that there were periods when the inspiration came more than others. Yeah. That's a really good question. I, yeah. I think... Uh, the way, yeah, the shifts that you're talking about, sometimes it's like I would have to work really hard, not even in the sense that I'm actually working on the music, but as though like, like for example, to pay for the, uh, you know, the orchestral arrangement and the recording of the 12 piece strings and the horns on the, on the lead single and title track that I had to wait tables for like four months just to pay for that one day of recording so it's like even though i'm not working on the album always that whole time sometimes wouldn't work on it for weeks at a time it's like i'm aware every day when i'm there waiting tables that it's like it's like i have a child or something that i'm working and i'm like i know that i'm supporting this thing it's like i knew exactly where every penny was going and even some days like i would just feel totally like, what am I doing with my life? Like, this is so depressing. But then I would wake up the next day and I'd feel reinvigorated. Like, no, this is my focus. Like, this is where my attention, this is where everything goes. What was the depression there? Was it was it just, you know, specifically working in a restaurant? Was it just not being able to be where you had been with the band? Yeah, it's, well, it's definitely those two things. And it, of course, is corollary with every year that you get older, <laughs> you feel weirder and weirder about the fact that I'm watching like, all of my friends get married and like have quote unquote normal jobs and watching people start to talk about buying houses and you know, whatever, all that stuff that I start to feel more and more alienated because it's just not my life. And, but when I think about like, okay, the future I've had several times where I've gone, never mind. I'm going to, I'm going to, reroute this entire thing. I'm going to find a more stable career and I'm going to work towards having that stuff. But in the end, my heart always 
brings me back to music because I feel like that that deep experience that I have with it is really like what my heart is looking for. It's not so much the, and I believe the external stuff will come, but it's really this thing that when I think about, okay, not that anybody has just one purpose to their life. There's, you know, life is multiple aspects, but when I do feel what I guess you would call your soul's calling, I feel that like it really is a reward for my heart to do it. You're in Austin. I'm in New York. Um, you know, I know you were out here and, you know, mm-hmm. you're in LA and Berlin and all these, these kinds of places specifically are places where continuing to seek that dream is not abnormal. You know, that I assume that while yeah. you do have your friends who like do have these, I guess, more typical jobs, I mean, you're in Austin, you're, you're also surrounded by music. And, and in a way, a place like that can sort of be enabling of that lifestyle for, for better and for worse, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if you were in a smaller town, for example, it would probably feel a lot stranger to pursue that dream. I, I guess, yeah, and that it would be out of the norm. But I don't know if, well, in another sense, it would be cheaper to, to pursue that dream. But, but I don't know if like, if you're, if you're the kind of person that gets really galvanized by that, I don't know if it would matter specifically where you are. But I say that if like every single one of your friends had those <laughs> jobs and every single one of your friends was married, like the calculus right. oh, would yeah, be a yeah, good different. call. Yeah, it would be, it would for sure be a different experience if I was looking around and I was like, I feel like there's no one like me, but, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes I feel like that anyway, maybe it has nothing to do with my career. Thinking back, back to the times when I've worked for hourly wages and I do remember doing that mental math of figuring out like extrapolating in my head how long it would take and how many hours it would take for me in order to like purchase a certain thing or, or right, to, yeah. to pay for my rent. And, and I'm guessing that like when you're so single-mindedly focused on this dream and you are literally paying out of pocket for it, uh-huh. it makes you invest in it that much more, right? I mean, if a, if a label was out there paying for your studio time, it's far easier to take it for granted. Yes, that's very true. In fact, I I mean, that's that happened to me, of course, a little bit with Voxtra. Like now I see it differently. I think, oh, wow. OK, like being in a situation where. Well, yeah, where a, a label is supporting you to do this thing that you love, you know, God willing, if I get that when I get that opportunity again, it's like I will treasure that so much not view it as an imposition. This idea of sort of falling back in love with the music that you you were talking about earlier, was that falling out and then falling back in? Were you were you talking specifically about the time between Vox Tried and your first solo record or the period between the two solo records? I would say the period between the two solo records. You know, the the first one it was like like kind of uh and s- was kind of some like searching for inspiration still like some of it was really felt inspired and some of it I was searching for inspiration and kind of knew that was the case and felt a little bit like I was at points like okay I'm interested in this and this and kind of throwing stuff at uh, at the wall and trying to be brave not so precious about it like let's just do it put together the album and put it out and this time I felt like by the time I started doing this one, I felt like I had a lot of inspiration. And especially in the last three years or so have really been, I feel really blessed and that I have felt like totally, yeah, totally inspired a lot of the time, which I have not felt in many, many years. But you had to reconnect with that. Yeah, I had to reconnect with it totally by going on this uh, just weird, long, however many year journey, like going going on this uh or going through this experience of, of, I guess you could say, yeah, loss of identity, like feeling pretty invisible. And especially, of course, that's in contrast to my previous experience of feeling very visible with Voxtra. They go to feeling very invisible and then having to relearn that, that it is not something that comes from the outside, that it's something that comes from the inside. And that that is what, what makes anybody valuable as an artist is sharing their true human perspective because that's the, there's the uniqueness. In the press material, you describe this idea of external wanderlust versus internal mm-hmm. wanderlust. 
Yeah. What does that mean? And, uh, you know, besides the obvious, what is the distinction? <laughs> okay. So yeah, for the, for the external wanderlust is the one, of course, that we think of the most, which would be, and actually, yeah, I guess what I should say for anybody who's listening, which I think is in the press material is I wish I could say that I came up with it, but it came from, it came from my, my therapist. He and his partner have this kind of amazing therapy umbrella. They do all these workshops and stuff. And I think that was the topic of one of them, but they talk about how, you know, people usually either have one fear or the other. Like some people are afraid of going out into the world, whether that's physically like going to a new place, but it could just be looking for a new job, trying to meet a partner, whatever it is. Some people are afraid of taking those physical real world risks of really putting themselves out there and seeing how the world is of, of facing the unknown essentially. And then other people have a different fear, which is they're afraid of going inside and they're afraid of looking at their psychology and they're afraid of looking at their past. And maybe one of the most important ones, they're afraid of challenging their conditioning. They're afraid of accepting the fact that the way, like what the values that they've absorbed from their parents and from society may not be really innate to who they are. And so for me, that was, that was the bigger thing. Like I had, I've been so good my whole life with external wanderlust. I've probably too good. Like I never wanted to stop moving, but with internal wanderlust, I never, I was so afraid to delve inside and try and understand like what psychological issues I have and why I have them. Aside from that sort of more abstract concept, Mm -hmm. What have you found out about yourself, you know, in the past several years and, and how, how is that manifesting itself on this record? I found out, well, one, one of the key things that I found out about myself was that I have had really difficult or really big issues with codependency, which is a word that I have, of course, heard millions of times and always just assumed, <laughs> always just assumed it meant, oh, that's when two people need each other too much. Like I never, I never really understood what that word meant until I started delving into it. And then I started to see kind of these patterns in my life, especially the way it had evolved to where I was like, oh my God, like I've ended up in this situation where I feel totally powerless. I feel like I can't take care of myself. I feel like I need other people to do absolutely everything. So then the way it plays into the record was, okay, like now I'm going to take on all of these, you know, like some different styles of music that I really love. Some things that I've been ignoring, like attention to arrangement or like really, you know, working on my voice, making myself better as an actual musician. All these things I thought I could always farm out to other people around me, like that I would kind of have half-baked ideas and I would depend on the talent or the input of other people to bring them to life and really deciding that I was going to do absolutely everything I could to make myself strong enough to really like take this vision of this album that I had and really construct it almost like building a house for myself to, sh to show myself that I had the, I had the power and I had the resilience to do that. It's one of those situations where you don't want to go too far in either direction because, you know, obviously you had been in a band and, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 to a certain extent, these solo projects are also a, a band in that, you know, right. they, are, they, they have been a reoccurring group of people. You know, you want to surround yourself with good people and you do want to trust in them to help you deliver on your vision. Yes, that is true. And actually, that is the other part of it is it's kind of like I got so into this idea of self-empowerment, which not that that's a dumb idea, but I went really far with that. And then part of this whole thing was, was with the inner work, basically, was starting to realize like, okay, there's also an extent to which I view myself as a special person, basically. And I kind of do always make myself put myself at the center of things and make myself the center of the, uh, the center of attention. And then starting to realize like, okay, now I have to see the degree to which whatever I'm achieving or whatever anybody's achieving in their life, they're really achieving with the, like in concert, you know, like with the, the co-emergence or the uh, 
co- or the cooperation of other people. And so it became like, if I'm going to be a band leader, I have to start thinking about it like, yes, I have this vision, but I, everything I'm doing, I also have to be taking into account like how it affects the lives of everybody involved and letting people choose things of their own volition, you know? like choosing to be involved in my project, not because I'm expecting it of them because it's something they really want of their own free will. So that ended up, it's funny you say it because that ended up being like the second part of that was reinvesting trust in people and, and being open to the fact that things were not going to happen exactly when I wanted them to happen, but that eventually it would come together. You do have to believe that you're, you know, a special person, or at least that you do have, you know, certain skills and abilities and something that you do want to share with people and that you feel is worth sharing with people. But Mm -hmm. I think we've all experienced this to a certain extent. I, I know I certainly have that the universe has a way of telling you that you're not as, as special as you <laughs> think you are. Right. Yeah. Or that you also start to see that how special the other people are that you work with or that, you know, that you're not really seeing because you're just worried about like people, you want everybody to understand that you're special and you're not seeing like, like how amazing your bandmates are, your friends are like, you don't really see other people completely because we're only thinking about them in relation to our self image. And it's like a very fine, very hard thing to uh, manage or to do right. Basically. Do you think that part of what stopped the momentum was uh, starting to take that for granted, starting to take the other people's inputs and their contributions for granted, you mean, uh, yeah, that could be. I mean, I think we all kind of took each, started to take each other for granted just across the board. I think we just started to feel like, yeah, but I think it's it's weird because partially yes, but partially also, I felt like as a band leader with Vox Trot, I became not very effective because I was. I was wanting everybody's approval, everybody like label, press, listeners, bandmates, wanting everybody's approval that I didn't do a very, I don't feel like I did a great job of driving the ship after a certain point. So it's like I lost faith in myself, but probably, yeah, also I just kind of, I didn't appreciate like how amazing my bandmates were and like, uh, like how much people contributed arrangement wise and stuff. I'm curious like how that how that kind of manifests itself and how seeking other people's approval can be a toxic trait in the, from that standpoint. You know, again, obviously to, to a certain degree it's you do want people's inputs and and you know and you do you, you want to make sure that you're not running things entirely like a dictatorship, but you know, what's the when does that start to become a problem? God, I think it might always be a problem. I think, or I think it might be that, that, oh man, it's so tricky. It's really like you always just have to. There's a, a degree of variation, but the vast majority of people in bands that I talk to tell me, and I, you know, I'm talking, I'm often talking to the lead singer, or the, uh, the the front <laughs> person, so they, they they often give me a similar answer. But but it is that to a certain extent that a band needs to be run like a dictatorship in that, like, obviously, you know, everyone has their own role and, you know, and, and it's important to know what people are best at, but like, there does need to be a somebody clearly steering the ship. Yeah. I feel that. I feel that, that that's true. But, but also what about bands where it is like more like even musically, it's more democratic, like bands with multiple songwriters. You know what I'm saying? There are absolutely cases of that. And I have absolutely talked to people who told me that. But one, I think it's in the minority. And two, you like hear all these stories about like, you know, whatever that Credence album was where they let everybody write a song. And like, <laughs> right. oh, sudden, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, like everything fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, maybe that's maybe it's why so many or almost, you know, basically all bands <laughs> fall apart. Maybe that's why is because it works like to where maybe in, 
when it's unselfconscious, nobody's really questioning it. Like the person driving the ship isn't really questioning it. The other members aren't really questioning it. And then like the more high profile it comes and the more money it generates, the more everybody's questioning it. And then maybe people lose trust in each other and in themselves. I, I would be interested to know how, how bands like you two that have existed for such a long time and, in my personal opinion, have, you know, not all have managed to at least consistently, you know, there are like these keystones of really great works that they put out over time. I'm really curious how they maintain that. I don't know if at some point it just, the level becomes so professional that you just accept it. I have no idea what it is. I would say knowing nothing about them personally, but, you know, looking at them, they seem like a band where everybody has a very clear role. Um, All right. Yeah. And I think it served them, but, but also like there's a reason why when you stay in a band that long, people go off and do solo things. Cause it's like, probably like, you know, hard being Adam Clayton after a certain period, yeah. you know, it's totally. probably hard to be in a band with Bono. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I guess I see. Yeah. It's like, I guess, cause I'm a lead singer. I see it so differently. I'm like, Oh, if I were in that band, I would just be Bono. So it seems like it would be great, but yeah, I totally I mean, see. Given the option, I think most people would want to be Bono, <laughs> but not everybody can be Bono. And it's funny. Yeah. It's probably hard to be Bono, even for Bono. It's probably hard right. sometimes. <laughs> I, there was some like quote from him recently where he, I don't know if you saw it. There's a story that came out that he, where he was just like, I hate all of our songs. That's funny. <laughs> I didn't read into it uh, more than that. Yeah. I don't know if that's just like being like hypercritical or maybe <laughs> they've been doing it for too long. Like this is one of the hard parts is when you first start out and you're getting all of that heat um mm -hmm. of course you don't want to take a break right i mean there there are there are a lot of stories of bands who have who have taken breaks and like have completely lost that momentum do mm -hmm. you need to yeah it does i guess if you i guess if you trust that well, I think it might come back to this idea of following your heart. Like, I guess if you trust that the stuff you're making is really from the heart, then you don't as much fear the uh, fear of something like taking a break. You don't as much fear like how public perception works into your uh, life as an artist. And I think some, I think some artists are just geared like that. Like, I don't, I don't really don't know that much about Kate Bush, for example. I love her music, but I haven't, I get the impression just like knowing, you know, like that there were so many years before she put out Hounds of Love that people thought she had like, they were like having VH1, where is she now specials, you know, like, and obviously that album was a huge hit. And I think it's such an incredible album. It's like, I think there are some artists that do work in that way where they are more individualist, single-minded, and they make different, they make decisions differently than an artist that like really loves having that constant public interaction. Kate Bush is a really interesting example because like, she's kind of a recluse, right? I mean, she yeah. has, she has essentially like disappeared for a couple of decades. So there, there's probably more going on there. Right. I mean, she's somebody who doesn't seem to be particularly comfortable with that level of fame. Right. Yeah, Totally. Getting back to this idea of sort of, I guess, writing music from the heart, um, mm -hmm. do you, was it difficult being too honest on record? Do you feel that your writing has become more honest as you progressed? I feel that it, it was, I feel that it was really honest in the beginning and has become so more and more again and is slowly approaching a place of even more honesty. You mean, you mean that it's ebbed and flowed or that it's gone steadily in the same direction? No, that it's ebbed and flowed. Like, I feel like, well, I, specifically with Voxtrot, I can tell you that the Raised by Wolves EP is the most honest. The Raised by Wolves is the most like, this is what's happening in my life because I was deeply in love with this guy this best friend of mine, the whole thing fell apart. I was really young. It was so, you know, it's what they say. The first cut is the deepest. It was so, it was so 
crazy. I didn't understand what people talked about when they talked about falling in love. I thought I was immune to that. I was like, oh, I'll have uh, date guys and I'll sleep with them and whatever. But like this love thing, like I'm too intellectual for that. And you were in your early 20s or like late teens, which like yeah, I was 19. But yeah, yeah, it, it completely shattered my idea of how life works. And it's so much to the point that that album is just like, or sorry, those five songs is like not even concealed as to what it is. Like it's so obviously that and then after that it got more like i don't know like it was lots of like was writing about like uh characters and books it just went more into this other thing where i didn't really want to write about myself and has kind of gone all right yeah i guess it's i guess it's ebbed and flowed i guess it's zipped back into it and now i'm to the point where it's weird like i like writing about myself and kind of the universal experience you know but as more and more i'm getting it's like yeah i just feel more and more compelled to just write the truest message from my heart and i hope to always keep moving in that direction reading you write about the first single and that mm-hmm. you know I, that it runs the gamut from the standpoint of writing about a relationship i think with mm-hmm. you know somebody who's like you know a, a number of years younger but using that to really to be hyper analytical about yourself, right? That it's not so much yeah. about that specific relationship. It's like yeah. more like, what does this say about who I was when I was his age and who I am now? Yes. Yeah. And it, yeah. Cause honestly, like, like that dating experience with that guy was so short. It was like, you know, I probably saw him. Well, actually I wish it had been really short. I continued to see him for like two years sporadically after that, like on and off. But <laughs> What's, uh, sometimes some things are good and other things are bad and you just have to appreciate <laughs> those things that are right. good. But the part like, yeah, I was like when I thought it was really going to be something before I just settled into this cynical, sporadic, whatever. It wasn't emotionally fulfilling. Right. Like it basically like that part was so short when I thought it was going to be something before he disappeared. It was so short. So it was like, yeah, most of it is just like how much this thing upset me and just like, like was the catalyst for me to start reading codependency books. And it ended up just unlocking to where I was like, like, oh, like, what is it? Like, what is it in my past that informs it in my conditioning? Like, what is it? Yeah. So it's funny how a little thing like that can spawn something bigger. I think for a lot of us, the lesson of the past two years has have really been, I mean, I, you know, I live alone in, in this, this apartment in, in Queens and mm-hmm. it has been a lesson in how to, and how to be alone. And it's hard. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's hard. You know, it's hard, like it's hard emotionally, it's hard physically. But like, I guess if you're lucky, and I feel this to a certain extent for all the bad things that have been going on globally. And for me personally, mm-hmm. that that I've learned how to be okay being with myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I definitely identify with that. I feel like I've just been with myself I was going to say, I feel like I've been with myself always, but the flip side of that is that uh, I have been lucky in that I've, I've had a lot of friends, especially when I was younger, had like an incredibly constant active social life. But I guess to a degree, always felt, I have always felt kind of, especially in, in the last 10, 15 years, I've always felt kind of lonely inside, you know, have not felt at peace have not felt deeply connected to myself to where I could just sit somewhere and just feel whole and not be wanting for something. Like I I haven't had that for many, many years and and only in recent years have started to have glimpses of that. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but 10, 15 years lines up pretty well with the end of the band. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's true. I didn't think about that. Uh, yeah, that, well, I guess that's when I that's when I started to have to do a lot of soul searching. But I, I think before that, it was there too. But it was masked because, well, because I was always busy. I was always touring, and I was just partying all the time. And I had a billion friends, and I was all over the world. And it was like I felt like okay, that's my life. Like this is what it is. I'm reasonably successful, and I would say minor to moderately famous like these are things that make me like 
Like I won't have to face quote unquote normal loneliness. But then of course I did not too many years after that have to face quote unquote normal loneliness. The, you know, I know people talk a lot about the idea of the great resignation, you know, of like all these people quitting their jobs over the past couple of years. Yeah. An element of that that I don't think people talk about enough is that the thing that's been gone in all of our lives is we don't have the constant distraction from all of the bad things about our lives and our jobs <laughs> and, and all of the like specific details about things that people don't like in their personal or work life have all come to the fore. And I think right. that's why so many people are deciding that they need to either like quit their job or leave town or make some right. sort of dramatic change. Yes. Yeah, I guess. I could see. I'm like, where do they go though? Where, where does everyone go? <laughs> there are a lot of job openings. I mean, and I know that, like, I know that I've lost a lot of people in in the city here. Like, a lot of people moved out of the city, which I mm-hmm. totally understand and respect of just like wanting to be out of in this urban area during a pandemic. Um, but the, I mean, the other side of it too. Uh, you know, I I talked to somebody recently in a, uh, a band who, you know, got back together after a long time. And I was like, yeah, I, I was comparing it to people, you know, it seems like a lot of people are kind of like reconnecting with their exes. Huh, yeah. In that, in that it's sort of like, like, oh, all this other bigger stuff has happened in the world. And like, you know, all, all the sort of like problems that we had in the past are kind of um, pale in comparison to these, the, these other issues, you know, is that, I don't know. Is that, you know, and it sounds like you and, and the guys are, have been good again or have mended those fences. I mean, are mm-hmm. those like, are those conversations that you had during the pandemic? About Voxtrot getting back together? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we've had that conversation like every two years, basically. <laughs> or Well, that's not true. I guess I've had it intermittently for sure. Uh, I've always seen the potential for that. Like have seen it, especially in recent years, it's like, like, okay, so there's always the possibility of like some more touring, like if we were to reissue the early material or something. So there's always the possibility for that. I've often seen the possibility of us just making more music together because I feel like we all would have grown as musicians in this time and as people, as humans. It feels almost to me like I've had moments where I'm like, why would we not do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. There's still a pretty, uh, I'm thankful to say after years of inactivity, there's still a pretty, you know, a reasonably large fan base and there would be opportunity, you know? So I, I always, sometimes it seems like a no brainer to me, but then there are other times where, where it feels like, well, like logically it seems like a no brainer to me, but if the energy doesn't want to go there, if the other, if people aren't choosing it of their own free will and it's an issue of me, like convincing that something is a good idea, then maybe that's just part of the growth is to, is to really let it go and, ex- and accept that like the future maybe is, does hold like hold something that I keep going musically. And I just don't know exactly what it looks like yet that I really, it's really impossible to envision the way that most things are. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing about getting back with your ex. I mean, if you've, I know, <laughs> I've, I've done it, I think we all have, you know, at a certain point, it's just like you do it and you're like, Oh yeah, this is why, <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is why yeah. it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, exactly. Or, or it's, well, I guess it's the same thing. I was going to say, or it's that like our capacity to uh, to um, not exaggerate, glorify, to glorify the past, to yes, there we go, to romanticize the past is so strong in that like like this this one series of sort of psycho spiritual books I love the Diamond Heart series. They have a long passage where they talk about how. How, you know, people always say like, oh, we're never, it's hard to be in the present. We always live in the past or the future. And he says, wrong. We only live in the past because even when we imagine the future, we imagine it based on the past. We imagine it based on an idyllic version of the past. Like the obvious and great analogy they use being that like when a caterpillar envisions the most ideal caterpillar life it's within caterpillar consciousness like i imagine like i would live at the bottom of this tree and i need be near a strawberry patch and i would be in hog heaven and but it doesn't know that like nature's intention is that it goes through this bizarre process and then would be a butterfly so it's like the human being is always imagining the past 
or the future based on an ideal past, but can't imagine for itself like what the future really holds. I've been in the city for uh, a, a long time now. And a few years ago, I had this moment where I suddenly like found myself romanticizing where I was in my early 20s. And like, and I was not in a successful rock band. I was, I was out in New York City and scraping by and living in some really kind of <laughs> horrible apartments and things were, you know, getting bed bugs and things were just generally miserable. Right. And I, I found myself like romanticizing for that time in my early 20s. And I had to just be like, what is wrong with, what is wrong with you? You, were, <laughs> yeah. you? you know, you know, if you just take like a sec back and just like, you're like, ah, oh, I was, I was miserable then. <laughs> what am I romanticizing? Yeah, that's funny. Totally. Totally. Gosh, it's, but yeah, but also with that, with being younger like that, I guess one, one thing that you do take for granted at the time is just the, is just sort of the absolute freedom. Like that, that feeling of really like, even when things are shitty, you, you take for granted that it's like, like every day holds so much possibility. Like you could really just drop it and move and whatever and start over. And you're so resilient that it's not, that it's never out of possibility. And it's like, I feel like with every year that you get older, that's actually technically still true, but it feels not like that. The, there feels to be some other weight. At this point in your life, looking forward, do you feel like music is going to continue to be play a, a role in your life? Yeah, I honestly feel like it's it for me. And uh, it took me until like very, very recently, probably the last two years to really commit to that idea in my head that I really loved it so much that I honestly was going to like keep opening my heart to it and keep doing it and keep taking risks and trust that it would show me the life would show me exactly how it was supposed to or exactly like the best way for me to pull it off. <laughs> 